I'd suffered with mental health problems my whole life, but I didn't know what it was because I never had no education on the matter. Um, and it wasn't until after the Klitschko fight, a very massive high, then I had to have a even worse a low, lowest low that anyone could ever have. Um, I'd wake up and I think, why did I wake up this morning? This is coming from a man who had everything, money, fame, glory, titles, a wife, a family, kids, everything. But I felt as if I had nothing. I felt there was an empty, gaping hole that was just filled with gloom and doom. And it just was one bad thing happened to me after another. Within seven days, the IBF stripped me of their title because I couldn't defend against Glasgow, who was a nobody, because I had a rematch clause with Vladimir. But the IBF wasn't expecting me to beat Vladimir. So they chucked that clause in there anyway, thinking Vladimir is going to win here to defend against Glasgow. But because I won, they they stripped me of the belt, which was none of my reason. I was in Holland training for the rematch and I was running up on heavy terrain and I went over on my ankle, sprained my ankle quite badly. So we had to postpone the fight. And but by the time I was off, like say three months, getting his ankle right and all that, I just I just didn't want to do it anymore, if you know what I mean. I didn't have the desire, the fire wasn't burning no longer to fight. And I was suffering with depression the whole time, even in training camp, before I sprained my ankle. I was depressed as depressed could be on a daily basis. And I'm thinking, why am I feeling like this? I don't have no reason to feel like it. Some people will say, oh, well, it's attention seeking or whatever. But unless you've experienced what I'm saying, it's sort of impossible to understand where I've been or where I've come from. And it just went from bad to worse. Um, I hate the drink heavily on a daily basis. I hate the drugs. Um, I was out all night partying with, with uh, women of the night and not coming home. And, you know, I didn't care about boxing. I didn't care about living. I just wanted to die. And I was going to have a good time doing it while I was doing it. I used to drink and take drugs to get away from the depression because when I was drunk or high, then I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think about being depressed. I thought about being I'm a, a boxing champion or I'm a, I feel great. But as we know, when the drink wears off, it only leaves you with a bad hangover and feeling even more depressed. For someone who suffers with mental health, the worst thing we can do to escape it is take drugs or alcohol. But yeah, that's the most common approach. And that's the common approach because people, we don't know because yeah. it's not spoke about. And this is where I want to spread the word on mental health so when other people are in this position in the future, they know where to go and they know what to do because there's a blueprint. I believe... When you've got a goal in mind or from being a child all your life and you do that, then it, I was like, I was lost. I was almost like I didn't have anything more to do in my life. Although I could have carried on and defended the belts and whatever, I wasn't really interested in doing that. I'd beat the man I'd always wanted to do. Because when I was an amateur boxer, I used to watch Vladimir Klitschko on TV as a world heavyweight champion. And I always aimed, he was my target to beat. And when I finally beat him, it was like climbing me Everest. I didn't have anything more to prove. And the fire was dead. There was no fire. I was forcing myself to fight. And I always said, I didn't want to be one of those people who just fought for money. Because there's plenty of people with money in the world. Plenty of them. But who knows them? And the reasons for me fighting, it's not for money. Or, or for belts or glory. I fight because... Of, I don't know anything else. I've always been a fighter, from being born to being 30 years old now. It's all I love to do. I don't have any other passion. I've looked. The Lord knows I've looked. And if I had anything else I was good at or I could do, I'd be doing it. <laughs> I just, I tried retirement. I was 27. I retired under the second man in boxing heavyweight history to retire unbeaten as a world champion like Rocky Marciano before me. But it wasn't enough. I was like, I am lost without this fight game. I tried golfing, I tried clay pigeon shooting, I tried four by four in, I tried going to strip clubs, bars, restaurants, everything. And it was just like, I had this emptiness inside where I just wanted to fight. My conditioning trainer, Christian, he said to me before the Klitschko fight, he said, what will you do after you win? I said, probably be depressed for a long time. He said, what? I said, truthfully, I was almost expecting it. And I didn't think I'd ever box again. Even the day after the Klitschko fight, Sky Sports interviewed me, the, the UK broadcaster who put it on. And he said, what's next for Tyson Fury? I said, I'll probably never box again. I knew. I said to me dad and my brothers before the fight, a week before the fight, I said, win, lose or draw. I said, this is probably going to be my last fight. Because I knew the fire was going. I didn't have that hunger anymore. I had the hunger to beat Vladimir Klitschko, but not to carry on and continue. 
And I said, I didn't want it to be about money or, or financial gain. I wanted to be the best of my time, beat the best man. And that's what I did. And I was a man of my word and I didn't box again. Until two and a half year later, I decided to make a comeback because I was sitting here at 400 pounds, a drug addict, an alcoholic. By the way, I'd never took a drug in my life until I got to 27. Really? Never. Nothing. Not smoked weed, not, not nothing. And what, drug what were free. the drugs? What were the drugs of choice once you won the title? Cocaine was the usual one. And that was it, really. Cocaine and alcohol. It's like Roller coaster. crazy drug, drug and alcohol mix. Mm. Yeah. But, you know, I look back on it now and I think, would I change that? I wouldn't. And not many people will think, well, this man's crazy for saying that on a radio show, but I wouldn't change a thing because I know it was supposed to happen and I needed to be tested to see what type of character it was. Although I did all those mad things and I went through all that time and I tried to commit suicide and how I... Did you, how did you try to commit suicide? Well, I'll tell you what happened. I, like I said, I was waking up and I didn't want to be alive. I was making everybody's life a misery. Everybody who was close to me was pushing away. Nobody could talk to me, talk any sense into me at all. And... I'd go very, very, very low at times, very low. And I'd start thinking all these crazy thoughts and this, that and the other. And I was in my car, I bought a, I bought a brand new Ferrari convertible um, in the summer of 2016. And I was in it and I was on the highway. And there's a strip of the highway where I am. And at the bottom of about a five mile strip, there's a massive bridge that crosses the motorway. And I knew that. And I got the car up to 190 miles an hour I was headed towards that bridge and I didn't care what no one was thinking. I didn't care about hurting my family, me, my career, people who friends, anybody. I didn't care. I didn't care about nothing. I just wanted to die so bad. I give up on life. And just as I was heading towards that bridge at 190 in this Ferrari, it had crushed like a Coke can, by the way, for the bit. I heard a voice say, no, don't do this, Tyson. Think about your kids. Think about your family and your little boys and girls growing up with no father. And everyone saying your dad was a weak man. He left us. He took the easy way out because he couldn't do anything about it. And I, before I turned into the bridge, I, I pulled on the motor and I was shaking. I could feel myself shaking and I pulled over and I was all nervous and I didn't know what to do. And I was frightened and I was so afraid. And I thought that day, I'll never, ever, ever try or think about taking my own life ever again. And I didn't. I went and got help from a, the leading psychiatrist um, doctor in the UK. And my dad went up with me and she said to me, Dad, she said, can I have a word alone with you, John? He said, yeah. My dad told me what she said when he came out. She said, he is not to be trusted alone. He's an imminent death risk. That's the highest level of suicide risk that she'd ever assisted. And she said, without his faith, he would have been dead a long time ago. But she said, faith alone ain't gonna hold him because that's gonna break. And once that goes, he's done. So that put me dad's life terror as well because he was checking up on me all the time. He wanted to be with me 24 seven. He was even sleeping in my house with me, a married man with four kids. I was in a right state. I just, I just, I, I wanted, I just didn't want to live anymore. And I had everything that a man could want. There wasn't nothing that I didn't have, but it meant nothing, nothing meant anything. I felt worthless. And the longer it went on, the, the, the more it, it hurt inside, and the more I was hurting everybody. Everybody gave up on me. My full family thought I was definitely gonna die and I was gonna kill myself. And after that, I, I tried, I was thinking to myself, you know what, I need to get better. I need, I need to do something. But every time I tried to go to the gym, I had another voice saying that. Nah, this ain't for us anymore. I'm not going to do this. I didn't want to do it. I'd run, I'd run 200 yards and pull up. I wouldn't even get a mile. I think, oh, can't be bothered. I don't want to do this. Boxing is not for me. I hated boxing at one stage. In 2016, early 17, I wouldn't have done a boxing fight for this room full of diamonds. No way. I hated boxing. I wouldn't watch it on the TV. I wouldn't read about it. I hated boxing. I'd done it my whole life and I didn't want no part of it anymore. Um, I was out drinking. I didn't care, I give up. Taking drugs, like I said. And it come to a point where I was doing that for 18 months of my life. And I was out 2017 Halloween. I was a 400 pounds dressed up as a skeleton. 
and I go to this fancy dress party and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, these are all young kids compared to me. I'm 30 and I feel like I was the oldest guy in there, like 29, I was like, what am I doing here? Is this what you want for your life? And I thought to myself, this is not me. And no matter how many people told me before this, where I was going wrong, what I was doing, you need to act to your life. You can only change your life if you want to change it. And I, I left and everyone said, are you going home early? I said, yeah. I left at nine o'clock, I went home. And I got back home, I didn't say anything to the wife, I went straight upstairs into a dark room. And I took the stupid skeleton suit off and I was, I was sat there. And I got on my knees and I was praying and begging God to help me. And at this point, I'd never, I'd never begged or cried to God to help me before. I'd prayed a lot all my life, but I'd never been in this physical state before. I could feel tears running down my face. My chest was wet with tears because I knew I couldn't do it on my own. It wasn't possible for me because I tried and tried and tried and ended up back in the pub, back drinking. I almost accepted that that was going to be my fate, an alcoholic. So I was on my knees in this bedroom and after praying for about 10 minutes, I got up and I felt the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. And for the first time in years, I knew I was going to make a comeback. And I called my wife, I said, Paris, Paris, she said, what? She thought I was drunk coming home from the pub. I said, Monday morning, I start to regain mission to try and get the heavyweight championship of the world back. She said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because before this, every time I'd have a beer, I'd come back and I'm going to be the heavyweight champion of the world again because it was, it was the alcohol talking. So I was like the man who called Wolf a thousand times on this, this stupid career that I, that I was living on the past, thinking about years before glory days. And after this prayer, I got up, I said, all right, this is going to be it. She didn't believe me one second. But even when I speak to her now, she says, that night you told me that, she said, I hear a difference in your voice. Something happened. Next day I phoned up Ben Davison. And I said, I don't want to go back down the old route with the same trainer, same promoter, same anything. I said, everything's got to change. I said, it's going to be a new Tyson Fury. And we called it Return of the Mac Mission. And as I went out that morning, after phoning Ben and ar arranging everything, I went out for a run in my sweatsuit. I had, I had ambitions of running two miles. I got about five minutes into the run and stopped. And I walked. And while I was walking, I thought, I can't run, I'm too fat, 400 pounds. But I thought, I'm going to walk, I'm going to get out and walk. While I was walking, I was flicking through on my phone on Instagram. And I see this video of Deontay Wilder saying, yeah, Tyson Fury's finally done that because the week before I'd been at a boxing show in Manchester or something and the press took a picture of me and it was like everywhere, this big, fat, out of shape, ugly, bald-headed, bearded, white-as-a-sheep man. I was like, a state. And he'd done this video, yeah, after seeing this evidence of Tyson Fury, I finally know he's finished. He can never come back and if he, even if I would have fought him in his heyday, I'd have knocked him out. And before that, he was talking about Mike Tyson, how he'd knock Mike Tyson out and around. And I thought to myself, that's very disrespectful to talk about someone who's not even from your era and wanting to fight them and all that sort of stuff. But there's no possible chance. So I thought to myself, you know what, if I ever do fight you, I'm going to give it you for that reason. And then when I saw this other video of him saying the things about me and that I couldn't come back and that, it gave me that much more motivation to return. Just so I can beat Deontay Wilder. Everyone said, no, you're never getting back. The, bo the Boxing Board of Control suspended my licence in the UK for the cocaine um, use. So I had a, a court case looking at ban, for ban forever, basically. Suspension. The doctor made me medically unfit to fight. So that was after, I forgot about that bit. When I was rescheduling the Klitschko 2 fight, uh, this psychiatrist phoned up and she says, look, he is medically unfit. He can't fight anybody. He don't want to live. Never mind fight. So I was medically deemed unfit to box, suspended by the Boxing Board of Control for the cocaine use, and I had an Androlone case on me, and a refusal case. And by the way, it was racking up millions of dollars in lawyers' fees too. But I was so confident that I was gonna, everything was gonna be okay, because when I was down on my knees, I just knew that it was gonna be okay. And everyone was like, what's the point in training and doing anything with you when you're not, you can't do anything, you're not in a position to do it. I said, everything's gonna be all right, don't worry. 
And on the way back, I spoke to Frank Warren, he became a promoter. And Frank said, right, you've had a long time out the ring, you've abused your body. Let's get you four or five comeback fights, just so you're ready. I said, okay, no problem. Had the one comeback fight, had the other comeback fight. I said to Frank, I don't need any more combat fights. Make the Wilder fight now. No, 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 no. He said, let's have a couple more just in case. I said, I'm telling you, make the Wilder fight. So this is where people don't understand. I've picked Deontay Wilder. He didn't pick me. I picked him.